Praise the Lord. Let's rise up on our feet as we take this song. Down at your feet, O oh Lord, is the most high place in your presence, Lord. I seek your place. Jesus. Okay, this is okay. I have a sermon titled Dear to Shine. And first of all, I want to, I'm grateful for this opportunity to share the word, even though I kind of asked that the cup will pass me, but I'm here. So I pray that, you know, God speaks through me. And we have. And thank you, Pastor Heidi, for this opportunity. It feels like an internship. So, yeah. Um, let's read from Isaiah 60, verse 1. That's the anchor scripture for our Yazim takeover weekend. Can we read it together? Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord. Is risen upon thee. Can we read this again? Arise, shine, for the light has come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. So, may the Lord bless the reading of this word. So many times we read this verse as a prophetic declaration of what God is set and is always willing to do in our lives. But today I'm led to approach this scripture from the way in which I believe the Bible describes what it means to shine. And if we look at John 8, 12, John 8, 12, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. So this place is saying that the light that is actually inside of us is Jesus. Since he says 
that he is the light of the world. And so I've written here that to shine is to live a life that reflects the character, the nature, and the person of Christ in our thoughts, in our words, and in our actions. It is the kingdom of God revealed through us, made manifest through us. Not only in our spirit and in our souls, but also in our bodies, overcoming sin, overcoming sickness, overcoming flesh, and everything that is on Christ-like in us is supposed to conform to him. When Jesus came to save us, his salvation was not just so we can remain the same. It was so we now have the opportunity to become like him on this earth. And we know that the first step when we give our lives to Christ, as we know, is Christ in us. But it doesn't stop there. He wants to be formed in us. And this transformation has to happen intentionally in cooperation with our will where we are also seeking transformation on, on every level, not only on a spiritual level, but on a mental level, on, on, on a physical level, like everything should not remain the same. And I wrote here that we should desire not only the manifestation of the gifts, but also the manifestation of the fruits of the spirit. I feel like sometimes Christians fall into a trap of chasing the spiritual gifts and power and anointing without placing a lot of emphasis on the fruits of the spirit that is supposed to be made manifest through us. So the first, um, this verse is saying, arise and shine for your light has come. This verse is saying that when the light comes, when a new degree of light comes, we would need to arise intentionally and actually walk in that light. Or it would be possible to remain stagnant without growth, even if we have giving our lives, our lives to Christ. So we do not get a revelation of everything at once when we give our lives to Christ. It takes us from glory to glory. So the first thing I wrote here is I want, um, he would not ask you to arise if he has not made provisions for your equipment. He, wrote, he said there, he says, your light has come, which means he does not tell people who he has not commissioned to arise. And so when you, you get, when you need to arise, we have to take courage. And it actually takes courage to be exposed to light. Because light, is, light makes you vulnerable. Light shows you things that you did not see before. We see in Isaiah 6, from verse 1 to 6, where prophet Isaiah, he encountered the Lord and he, he, he saw himself revealed. But it wasn't until that revelation happened that he was able to... Um, repent deliberately and repent genuinely. And then it says the angel of the Lord came to him and put a coat to his lips and told him that he is cleansed. So we must take courage when the light comes. He wants to rid us of our fears and our unchristlikeness. It's not trying to shame us. It's trying to make us better. Because normally, if we didn't need salvation in the first place, we wouldn't have needed Jesus. So we should understand that there's a possibility of us finding out things about ourselves or in that is insufficient, that is just not up to standard. And that is not when we turn away from God. That is actually the point to run to him, even if this is sin. Because... Uh, there is a, I wrote here, there is a power of God that is so real and true that it will take from your heart every desire for sin and to make sin very offensive to your soul. This is possible. We don't change from sin by ourselves. It is actually the Spirit of God that helps us. So anyone struggling with anything, you don't actually run away. You run to him with everything and with all of that baggage. So here... Uh, can we read from Genesis 12, verse 1, please? Here, the Lord said to Abraham, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to a land that I will show you. So here, the Lord is tell, told Abraham to arise and go to somewhere that he will show him. He didn't give him the full details. He didn't know exactly where he was going, but he took courage. And I have a Google Maps analogy here. If we just have our destination in mind, but we don't know 
what is the route. We just put it on the maps and then we turn at whatever direction, at whatever point it says we should turn. And the thing about obeying God is that if we don't turn at a specific point, that would be where we'll be stuck at till we actually make that turn. And so when the Lord calls us out by revelation through his light, through his word, through his servant, through different means by which um, light comes to us, we should take courage and arise because he has made provisions for you to overcome. And I wrote here that sometimes the light comes to rid us of our mental biases and incorrect perspective. And the example I have here is Peter from the book of Acts 10, verse 9 to 20. So here is Peter. Uh, can we have, we have it up? So he says, the next day, as they went on their journey and drew near to the city, Peter went up on the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. Then he became hungry and wanted to eat. But while they were made ready, he fell into a trance and saw heaven opened and an object like a great sheet bound at the four corners, descending to him and let down to the earth. In it were all kinds of four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, creeping things, and birds of the air. And a voice came to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, Not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything common or unclean. And a voice spoke to him again the second time, What God has cleansed you must not call common. And this was done three times, and the object was taken up into heaven. Now, while Peter wondered within himself, what this vision which he had seen meant. Behold, the men who had been sent from Cornelius for Simon's house and stood before the gate. And they called and asked whether Simon, whose son name was Peter, was lodging there. While Peter thought about the vision, the spirit said to him, Behold, three men are seeking you. Arise, therefore, go down and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. So we see here how the revelation came to Peter. This is revelation which can symbolize that with light as well. That it can, the Gentiles can also be saved, can also be baptized in the Holy Spirit. But it needed to come to him in that vision and in that trance. And this was like, you know, in these days, like racism, like racial prejudices that we have in our hearts. That is an hindrance to what God actually wants to do through us so when this comes when he says when he told peter to arise peter did arose and if you see there we see that everyone there was baptized in the holy spirit but it came from um peter having uh, to be exposed to his racial prejudices and and then making an action about it so yes that is that point. And then my next point here is that I wanted to draw from this scripture is that it says we should arise and shine. So if it's saying we should arise and shine, that means that when darkness in any form surrounds, there is a posture that the heart must take. So the notification says arise and shine for your light has come. So that notification is expecting to meet you in a certain place. It's expecting to meet you waiting on the Lord. Not a posture of running around looking for solutions outside of God. We should learn to wait on the Lord. And many times, God wants us to learn to wait on him so that he can, you know, drain distractions out of our blood, out of our spirit, out of our body, so that we can actually be purified. Because his focus is not only the things that we want. His focus is that we be made clean. And the psalmist says, create in me a clean heart. I renew a right spirit within me. And he also says in Psalm 24, that who can ascend to the holy hill of the Lord? It is he who has a clean heart. God wants to fellowship with us. And so many times it will keep us in a place where we might not be getting what we want at a specific time because there's a lesson to be learned. But it doesn't mean that we stop waiting. We must wait on the Lord. And, um, and sometimes you might not even be getting what you want because he's trying to preserve you. Or you've been weighed, you've been weighed in the spirit and he sees that this person doesn't have the capacity to handle what she's asking for, what he's asking for. So let's first build this capacity. I have answered your prayers, but you must build capacity first. And sometimes when God, when the answer to our prayers come, 
it might not be that first thing. It might be the, 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 the veil that is blocking that actual answer that God is trying to show you. And like, no, this is not what I asked for. And God is like, yes, but this is needed before the next step. So when, we, when, we, when darkness in any form surrounds us, and um, the open heavens yesterday and today talks about different forms of darkness. And so we can look at that and see the ways in which we can know that, okay, this is a darkness situation. We should learn to wait on him. We should learn to pray. And we should reject spiritual laziness and actually stay with the word. We need the grace of God to sit down in one place. I feel like it's not easy to sit down in one place. It's not easy to fast. It's not easy to pray. It's not easy to to not have, to feel like, oh, I deserve exposure, but I don't have exposure right now. It's okay to reduce your typical exposure so that God can form you, form himself in you. That is the main thing. We want to show Christ. A lot of people in this day and age, they mock Christianity because they cannot see the transformation. And I really believe that Christianity doesn't, will not mean anything to the world if we do not take the step to actually be transformed by the word of God. And many people ask, uh, how long do I wait? Or how long do I pray for? When someone is facing a specific situation and you ask them, have you prayed about it? And you're like, oh yes, I've prayed about it. When you find out how long that prayer was, it might just have been, oh God, just handle the situation and that's it and they left. I'm not saying God doesn't answer that kind of prayer, but your level of desperation is not commensurate with the level of, you know, you're waiting on God. That means you have another source. That means either you're depending on yourself or you're depending on your uncle or you're depending on your auntie. But if you were truly depending on, on God, then you will pray more. You will pray. And, and when the Bible says, how long do we pray? We can see an example from Elijah. Can we open to First Kings 18 from verse 41 to 44? And I read, then Elijah said to Ahab, go up, eat and drink, for there's a sound of abundance of rain. And so Ahab went up to eat and drink. And Elijah went up to the top of Camel. Then he bowed down on the ground and put his face between his knees and said to his servants, go up now, look towards the sea. So he went up and looked and said, there is nothing. And seven times he said, go again. Then it came to pass the seventh time and he said, there is a cloud as small as a man's hand, rising out of the sea. So he said, go up. Say to Ahab, prepare your chariot and go down before the rain stops you. So we see here that he told his servant to go up after he got that notification that, after he got his sign that, you know, something had changed. So we pray until we see the cloud manifest, either in the, earth realm or either as a substance in our heart. Sometimes we pray for something and we just know that this prayer has been answered and God is like, you don't need to pray about it again. And that is faith that has been furnished into our hearts. So that is how long we are supposed to pray for something. We don't quit praying for anything if that we want, especially if we don't have that assurance that has been furnished into our hearts or the physical manifestation of it. So let's try to um, you know, stay with God in the secret place. Last week, the guest minister said that from 12 to 1, we should, he implored us to, you know, just praise God. Or if you even want for seven days or as long as you want, how many days as you want. Or even add an extra hour to pray. Like challenge God. You don't have to do the status quo. You can do extra. You can do the old 24 hours. Praying in tongues at your place of work. And praying when you get back home. Like just staying in that place of prayer. And for the young people. For the teenagers here. I also want to implore you to start to learn how to pray. And stay with God. And your parents don't even need to know that you are talking to God. Like you need to get past that. Where you're... You, you use your relationship with God to get goodness credit or to get good girl credit. It is past that. This is your life. And this is, he is the source of your life. So you have to get to a place where you've conditioned your mind to just talk to God anyway. And nobody needs to know that you are talking to God. And nobody needs to know that this is how long I am spending with God. It is not for 
um, it is not for applause with the world that you spend time with, with God. It's for fellowship. The same way that um, the Bible used the description of a marriage to represent our relationship with Christ. And lastly, we need to engage the word. That's what I wrote here. And if we read Psalms 119, verse 130, it says, The entrance of the word giveth light, giveth understanding to the simple. So this place is basically giving us an expo. So when you want to grow in Christ, then you actually engage the word of God. Not only you study the word, you read the word, you meditate on the word, you declare the word, you confess the word, you listen to the word. When you come to church, you actually listen to the sermon. When you go back home, you can listen to more sermons. You can read books from people who, you know, have, uh, have had a certain amount of revelation in an aspect that you're asking God for. You can just be hungry. And I wrote here that uh, hunger is actually good because it is only the people that are hungry that can eat. So when God gives us, when we have, we need to have, we need to desire a hunger. And the deepest hunger of our souls has to be God. We can't say, God, I'm not growing or you're not showing me anything if we are not hungry for him. Or if they take an x-ray of our lives and the, mo the first thing that we are the most hungry for on that list is not God. Then you can't really blame him. So he wants, to, he wants us to get to a point where he is the deepest hunger of our souls. And the Bible says that blessed is he who hungers and thirsts for righteousness, for they shall be filled. But when you are not hungry, there is no feeling happening. Anybody that is hungry would even hear the word of God from a little child. You will hear the word of God. You know, you will be sensitive. Your mind will be tuned into it. So I want us to just ask God to give us a deep hunger, like a hunger that burns from within us where I just want to be like Christ. I want to be a testament to your transformative power. When they said that people are supposed to be able to touch us and they will be healed, that is not, for, that is not a story for the Bible. That is actually supposed to be happening in this day and age. But we don't see it happening because we have not... We have not gotten there, but it's not impossible. So when we are setting role models, when you are setting somebody that you want to look up to, it should not be any man. It should be Jesus. Because Jesus is saying that you can do what I did. Because you are a son of God the same way he is the son of God. So I pray that, you know, our, even if you already have a hunger, you can have more hunger. You can have more hunger where, you know, all of your desire is just centered around Jesus and around manifesting and and declaring his glory so it seems like i have more time and my sermon is done <laughs> so <laughs> i mean okay so today's maybe we'll, i'll read a little bit from i don't have time oh well okay we can round up let's stand up Uh, I want us to take this song before we pray. Lord, open up your word. Lord, and let me Ask him to send forth this word. Oh, let them fly. Let them fly.
anything that has hindered my promotion so far, destroy it by your power in the mighty name of Jesus. Father, let's begin to pray that the Spirit will come and rid us of everything, every hindrance that is preventing our growth, every barrier, every veil, everything that we need to see. Oh Lord Jesus, every stronghold in the mind, every stronghold in the mind, we ask that your spirit will come like a mighty rushing wind and destroy it in the name of Jesus. Let's ask him, I want to be a testament to your transformative power. I don't only want to use my mouth to say Jesus is good. I want my life to show that Jesus is good. I want my life to show that Jesus is love. I want my life to show who Jesus is. I don't want people to see, to think of Jesus and think of an angry Jesus. I don't want people to think of Jesus and think of an unforgiving Jesus. I don't want people to think of Jesus and think of a Jesus that just criticizes and criticizes them. I want them to see Jesus for who he is through my life. Uh, let's ask him. I want to be a testament, Lord, to your transformative power. Let's pray against every cowardly spirit that prevents us from manifesting his power. Let's ask that that will be destroyed in the mighty name of Jesus. He says, wake up, O sleeper. Arise, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. He says, wake up, O sleeper. Arise and shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. Spirit of cowardice is broken over my life. The spirit of fear is broken over my life. Because his word says, the Lord has not given me a spirit of fear. He did not create me with fear. He gave me a spirit of love. He gave me a spirit of power. He gave me a spirit of a sound mind. And this mind is the mind of Christ. This mind is not the mind of my generation. This mind is not the mind of my of my forefathers. This mind is not the mind of, that's how they are in my family. This mind is the mind of Christ. When we were translated from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his marvelous light, he says that he is the light inside of us. I want this light to shine through me. Lord, I want this light to shine through me. Let's pray today. I no longer live a life that is characterized by fear. He says, perfect love cast out all fear. He says, perfect love cast out all fear. I don't know what you are afraid of. I don't know what you think is holding you back. He says, perfect love cast out all fear. I ask that your spirit, oh Lord, will flood every heart in the mighty name of Jesus. In the mighty name of Jesus. Father, let this word go home with us. Let it settle in our hearts. Let it plant deep roots. In the mighty name of Jesus. For in Jesus' name, I've prayed. Amen.